All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope everyone's still doing okay in our present unusual situation. Um, announcement. I hope you all saw the announcement already on Avenue that the deadline for the fourth project has been extended by one week in order to accommodate in advance um, various difficulties that we might experience uh, as a result of working from home, online, uh, and so forth. And so that gives us two more lectures where we can unfold some techniques and strategies that we might use in the fourth project in a little bit more detail than we might otherwise have been able to do. And so today's lecture uh, is going to talk about simulation. And we're going to talk about it and then spend a lot of the lecture demonstrating some simple approaches to simulation in the processing environment that um, probably many of you are going to use for your fourth project. Although there are, of course, um, other possibilities, other possible ways of completing the project. So this discussion of simulation is happening in the context of our module on interactive and generative art. And we saw that already that generative art was art that was generated by rules, where the artist creates the rules, and then the computer, usually a computer, executes the rules um, to produce the surface that the audience experiences. And so in that um, particular setting then, simulation is a particular application of generative art. Basically, simulation is the idea that we can set up rules that model some real world situation, or perhaps that model some situation that is kind of like the real world. So in, um, in our time, we've uh, gotten used to some very spectacular examples of simulation in computers. If we have um, ever played a, a 3D video game, uh, or for that matter, a 2D video game, um, in those situations, we're presented with systems that have spectacular graphical effects, um, but which in those games um, have characters and models and objects that move about as a, as a simulation or representation of some real world um, situation. Um, we're going to use the word uh, real world very, very loosely um, as, we, as we continue here. So basic idea, simulation is uh, a subset of generative art where our rules are not just rules that control drawing or control sound, the rules also reflect or model some real world situation where real world is understood in a kind of flexible way. And what this is going to allow us to do is to also explore um, effects like emergence that we've seen in previous lectures in new and interesting, interesting ways. So that's simulation um, in general. Let's get into the nitty gritty of exploring how we might go about simulating things in a processing sketch. So I'm going to um, do the best practice that I talked about in a previous lecture, and I'm going to start with a simple processing sketch that does almost nothing, just to prove that that works. There we go, it worked. And now in my setup function, which happens once when the sketch starts, I'm going to set a different canvas size, and I'm going to test that. Always good to test as I go along. Sure enough, I have a bigger canvas size. And now I'm going to do something a little bit like what we um, did in a previous lecture. So um, I'm going to draw an ellipse, but I'm going to draw the ellipse at a random location um, in the x and y axis. So this will pick a random number between 0 and 400. This will pick a random number between 0 and 300. So we get ellipses drawn at random locations on every frame. And I'm going to make them 25 pixels high and 25 pixels wide. And this is something like we might have seen last week. So we get a pretty pattern that forms and we see some emergence because this pattern has visual interest that far exceeds um, what is in the rules here. The rules just say draw an ellipse, but 
when we actually go and execute the rules, we get an effect that seems to be somehow more than the rules. That's emergence. Everything I've said there so far is review. Now, if we look at this um, sketch, simple processing sketch that we've made, like one we would have made last week, um, there's a pattern that's unfolding um, and there's no um, repetition in it and there's no sense here that we're dealing with um, stable objects that are moving around. So this is an interesting pattern, but it's really not a simulation. Uh, it's really not um, in any sense a model of the world. So we might contrast it with another example. What if we did this instead? An even simpler example that draws an ellipse at the center of the screen. Well, now we definitely have the sensation that there's an object in the middle of the screen, a circular object in the middle of our visual frame. Um, but this also is not a very good candidate for a simulation um, because the object isn't doing anything. It's no nothing in this scene is moving. And so, I mean, I guess we could say it's a simulation of a scene where nothing is happening, but that seems like um, stretching the concept uh, a little bit too far to me. So between the thing that doesn't move at all and the thing that is in a random location all the time, between those two possibilities, there doesn't seem to be much that is worth calling simulation. So we need something kind of in between these two examples where things can move and things can behave, but they're not sort of being drawn in a completely random way, each frame. So that's what we're gonna try and develop now. And to do this, we need to um, learn some new notations in processing. And so I'm gonna introduce these notations by modifying the sketch that we already have. So what if, instead of writing the sketch this way, I wrote it this way. I'm just gonna do it first and then show you that it gives the same result. So here I'm gonna run it. And once again, we see a, an ellipse in the middle of the screen. So what I did here in this new variation on our previous sketch is I declared two variables. So X is a variable and Y is a variable. And a variable is a piece of information that is used by our program, although it is invisible while the program runs. And when I make it here in line four, I make this variable called x, I'm also putting in it the number 200. So when this first gets created, it contains the number 200. And when I make the variable y, it first contains the number 150. You'll remember that everything after these slashes is a comment. And the float in these lines above is a, re a reference to the type of the variable. And a float is basically uh, a number, a positive or negative number that can also have decimal places. So because this is a float, we could, we could say 200.5 if we wanted. So the variables x and y are like locations where some information gets stored. And here, when we first create them, we're putting the numbers 200 and 150 in them. And then later, when we go to draw the frame, we're taking those numbers out and using them to decide where to draw the ellipse. So when our, our, when our um, processing sketch starts, actually, the first thing that happens is that these variables get created. And the second thing that happens is that our setup routine and all of the things inside it happens. And then the third thing that happens is that the draw function and everything inside it happens repeatedly. And so every time this line happens, it's going to look at whatever the current value or the current contents of X or Y are. And this simple change 
is going to let us do a simulation because now we can change the values of those numbers in ways that refer to what the numbers already were. For example, if I do x equals x plus 1 and y equals y plus 1, every frame when we get to here, processing is going to look at what the existing value of x is, it's going to add 1 to it, and then it's going to put that number back in x. So x will be 200, but then after it goes through this one time, it'll be 201. And then it'll be 202, and then it'll be 203 and 204 on successive frames. And then the same thing for y. And so when we run this sketch now, our ellipse is going to run off the screen, and it's never going to come back because x and y are going up all the time. But let's run it again because even this little simple change, with just this little simple change, I think we've moved into the realm of simulation. Because now we have an object that appears to move on the screen. So I'm just going to reorganize this sketch a little bit, put this more in the order that things happen. First, our variables exist then our setup function happens, then our repeated drawing happens. So um, let's, let's address the issue of the thing running off the screen um, because you know our, our current simulation, I think it's a simulation, but it's not a very interesting one because it ends so quickly. Once the ellipse has run off the screen, it's not really very interesting to watch this for much longer. So what we need to do is figure out when the ellipse is running off the screen and make it turn back maybe or go somewhere else. So what if we um, instead of um, adding one all the time so it's always moving down uh, always moving down and always moving to the left what if we make another variable that we'll call speed we'll make it 1 to begin with, and we'll make a y speed as well that we'll call 1. So all three of these things are variables. So I'm going to delete those comments. I'm going to make my fonts just a little bit smaller so that we can see all of this easily. Maybe that's a little bit too small. I'll make it a little bit bigger. There we go, perfect. So now we have these four variables. And every time, every time we draw a new frame, before drawing the circle, we're going to add x speed to x and y speed to y. And then when, if the x position goes greater than or equal to 400, which is the the right edge of our screen, we will make x speed minus 1 instead. And if the x position is lower than or equal to 0, which is the left edge of our screen, we'll make x speed be 1 again. So the idea is that it's going to kind of bounce. When it hits the right side of the screen, we're going to change the speed to the this negative number, so it's going to subtract x values instead, and it's going to move in the other direction. Uh, and then we'll do the same thing for y, except that um, we'll bounce at 300 since our canvas is only 300 pixels high. And when we run this, what we're going to get now is this. So it looks like an object that's leaving a trace. Uh oh. Looks like it didn't quite work. Oh, I see why. It didn't work because I copied and pasted here, but I didn't change x to y. And that shows you one of the dangers of copying and pasting code. It's especially dangerous to copy and paste code from other people because you might not understand it. But even copying and pasting your own code um, can lead to mistakes and confusion. Let's try it now. Oh, 
it still doesn't work. And for the same reason, I meant to change Y speed here. So same mistake. I think I've actually fixed the mistake now. Let's try again. Okay, now it's bouncing nicely. And even though it's leaving this um, strange trace after it, it it still, I think, qualifies as a simulation. The, the trace um, complicates what it looks like a little bit, uh, gives us some emergent, vis vis emergent visual effects. Um, but even so, um, we do have the sense of a ball um, bouncing around. In the spirit of bricolage programming, where we make small changes and then um, see what our intuitions tell us about what we could do as a next step. Um, I, I have an intuition right now that I want to try what this looks like if I do it really fast. So I'm going to change the speed here to being, um, I don't know, how about 50 times faster? What's that going to look like? Well, actually, my change wasn't very good because I made the initial speed 50, so we get the ball moving very quickly. Um, but then down here in my code, I'm setting the speeds to 1 and minus 1 again when it bounces. So I'm going to make a little change here. When, when the x position of the circle is greater than or equal to 400, I'm, instead of setting the x speed to minus 1, I'm going to set it to whatever the x speed was before times minus 1. So I'm going to do that for all of these. In other words, if the speed was 50, it would become minus 50. If the speed was minus 50, it would become 50. I'm going to do the same thing for the y dimension as well. So now we should have a properly bouncing, quite rapidly ball. We still get a similar pattern, and it gets kind of uninteresting after a while because it's just bouncing to the same locations it's been before. So what if... Uh, and here again, I'm just following instincts. I'm just uh, following intuitions that I get from seeing the results. What if when it bounces, the speed was chosen randomly in a certain direction? So if, it's, if, it's, if, it, if, it's, if x is greater than or equal to 400, that means it's hit the right edge of the screen. And so what if we set it to a negative number um, between zero and 100, between, between minus 100 and, and zero. So we, in other words, random 100 is a number between zero and 100. When I multiply that by minus one, I get another. When I hit the left edge of the screen, I want a positive number, so I'll just put random 100. And then I'm gonna do the same thing for the two y dimensions as well. And let's try that out. We should get a pattern that accumulates more. So now we're, in a way, we're kind of somewhere in between our random drawings from the other day and, uh, and a simulation where we get the sense of an object here. We still kind of have the sense of an object bouncing around here, but we also have a, some more randomness um, in it. Um, I think one way that we could bring this back in the direction of a simulation while still holding on to some of this visual complexity would be if the previous... Um, results were fading away to some extent. So I'm going to see if I can um, start to work with color and transparency in this module. So I'm going to make my colors in HSB, in other words, HSV model, and they're going to go from 0 to 100. And I'm just going to get rid of the space here so we can see everything. I'm going to say that every time it draws an ellipse, it does it with a different fill color. And the uh, let's make everything green because I'm feeling green today. So green would be about 33% of the way around the color wheel. So a hue of 33. And if we want to make this really rainbowy, we'd use a maximum saturation, so 100 and a brightness value, um, let's make it, um, let's make that 100 as well. 
And if we give a fourth argument, it should be um, an, um, it'll be the alpha or transparency. So let's set that at 50 and see what kind of results we get. Yeah, so you can kind of see the transparency. Our circles are bouncing around, but we can see previous circles under the old circles. So still the previous things aren't fading away, it's just they're getting mixed with the new things. So one way to make things fade away would be to make a, a rectangle that is semi-transparent, uh, actually mostly transparent, and to um, write that rectangle each frame. So it's like each frame, before we draw a circle, we draw a rectangle that is semi-transparent and covers the whole screen, and that makes the, all of the stuff that's there previously fade out a little bit. So let's make it fade to, to black, for example. So I'll have a hue of zero, a saturation, of zero and a brightness of zero. That's black in the HSV or HSB color model. And let's make it 25% transparent and we'll draw a rectangle at zero by zero that covers the whole screen before picking a different color and drawing our ellipse. So I'm gonna try that now. And so now we definitely have the sense of a ball that is bouncing around and we can kind of see a visual echo of it as it bounces around. This is very much a simulation. If we were to do different layers of this, this could become an interesting piece, I think. So still, in the spirit of bricolage programming, I want to try another variation upon what I just did. We've been filling the screen with a rectangle, a semi-transparent black rectangle, uh, in order to hold on to some of the previous frame's visuals. But um, we're really still not holding on to very much. So I want to try an even lower transparency value to see what happens here. I'm going to try a transparency value of 2 out of 100. So we're really not putting a lot of black in each time. And now we get a much slower fade of our previous images. I like that a lot. And this suggests to me one more change uh, that we could make. Right now, everything is green. If we did the kind of things we were doing last week with this, we could make the, the hue of the circle randomly chosen, let's say a random value between 0 and 100. That's the kind of thing we might have done last week. So now we get circles that are changing color as they bounce around. And if you notice, the changing color here, because the colors change randomly and they change so dramatically, it, it makes it harder to feel like this piece is a simulation. We start to get more of the impression of different circles being drawn than of one circle changing color. And that's because those color changes are so dramatic and our perceptual systems in our bodies are used to thinking of objects having a stable color. We're not really used to objects changing color in front of us. You know, when we see things that, we think about things in our everyday life that change color, right in front of us. It's usually um, like some kind of signal, um, like, a, like on, the, on your laptop, you're the thing that plugs, when you plug in your laptop, maybe there's a light that turns green instead of red or this kind of thing. Um, so let's try to make this have more stable color. Let's make our color also be a variable, our hue. So I'm gonna make a variable and I'm gonna call it hue can call these things anything I want, so long as I don't use a name that's already used for something else in processing. Let's call it hue, and let's start it at zero, and let's, um, let's have hue go up by um, 0.25, so not very much, each frame. And now what we're going to get is something that gradually moves around the color wheel. Well, it's not so gradual, is it? Oh, sorry, we've still got the old result because we made the new variable starts at zero and we're making sure that the variable changes every frame, but then we're not using it in our drawing. So actually I want the hue to go here so that the, the ellipse that we draw has the color of that hue. 
and there we go. Now, in addition to bouncing around in terms of its geometric position, our circle is bouncing around in terms of its color as well, which I think is kind of neat. All right. So I want to step back for one second at this point and um, look at what we've done. And I want to call your attention to a structure that's here that is really, really useful if you're going to be making pieces that involve simulation at all. If we look at what is inside our draw function, this list of instructions that happens repeatedly every frame, notice that there's a division here. So starting here in line 11, we've got instructions that all they do is look at variables and change variables. So in this area that I'm highlighting here, there's nothing that is actually drawing. All we're doing is looking at what is stored in those variables we made and changing it. So this is like the rules of our model. And then if you look down here, we're using those variables, hue and x and y, to draw. And so this is where we're translating the model into a visible effect. And if you can organize your thoughts in these types of simulation-oriented pieces in that way, it often helps um, keep, things, keep things straight uh, and lets you go a little bit further with the, with the work. So I'm just going to put a comment in this to show that structure. Rules that read and modify variables, i.e. The, the model, the, the rules of the simulation. And then down here, we have instructions that draw to the screen based on the model, based on the variables. So that's a really, really, really useful structure. Um, we'll be able to um, do some really interesting things with that. So as I want to, uh, the last thing that I want to show you in this lecture is an example of what I mean about how this kind of separation in our thinking, keeping rules that modify the variables in a separate place than instructions that draw to the screen, how that could be useful. So what I want to do is in, uh, I'm going to make a new function and it's going to draw a letter of my name or something like that. Um, how about it'll draw, actually, how about we draw a zero? That's a nice thing because I'm Dr. Zero after all. And I'm going to give this these arguments. I'll talk in a second about what I mean by arguments for the x position and the y position of the zero. And I'm going to put some curly braces. So um, what I've just done is made my own function called draw zero. So it's like adding an instruction to the language if you want to think of it that way. Notice how similar this looks, our, our line that starts void draw zero, to our line that starts void draw. And notice that the draw here is getting highlighted by processing in a different color, while draw zero isn't. isn't. Because processing's editor knows that draw is an instruction that already exists, uh, a special instruction for this language, whereas draw zero is just something that we're making up. Um, whatever instructions I put in here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move our ellipse in there. Whatever instructions we put in here, they will happen whenever we call this function. So I'm gonna call draw zero with my x and y variables. And I'm going to change this to x pos and y pos. So to explain this again, uh, a slightly different way, what we've done here is we've made our own instruction called draw zero. It needs two numbers to work, which are going to be provided by whoever uses the function. They're going to be provided whenever the function is used. And so x pos and y pos here and here 
are going to be whatever is provided here and here. And so because draw zero right now is just our ellipse, when we run this, it'll just work exactly the same way. But now what I can do is I can change this a little bit. So let's make ellipse, um, an ellipse centered on X position and Y position. Let's make it pretty high and not so wide. And that will look like this. And then let's put a line through it to be the slash of the zero. You know, like how these, well, I guess my zeros have dots in them, but I'm sure you've all seen those zeros with lines through them um, in other fonts. So let's make a line from uh, X position minus 25 and Y position minus Actually, I have a new idea. I, I, want the, I want the ellipse to be taller than it is wide. So this should be 50 and 100. And now in line, I want to draw the slash through the circle. So I want that to start, um, yes, at 25 to the right and 50 down. And then I want it to end 25 to the right and 50 up. I think I said that wrong. Um, what's that going to look like? Let's take a look. Oh, I think I, I did it. I did it backwards than what I intended to, but that's okay. So now we're getting circles and lines that are being drawn. Yeah, that's neat. So let's reflect a little bit on what we've done here now. Um, we've made a function of our own called draw zero. And of course, we could make this very complicated. I could put in a bunch of instructions here to do some really very detailed drawing on the basis of these numbers that I declare. And then all of that becomes available to me as a single instruction I can use elsewhere. And this um, comes back to my idea that it's useful for us to separate our rules that read and modify variables from our instructions that draw to the screen. Because really what that lets us do is on the one hand have some pretty simple variables that reflect the elements of our model, and then we have rules that modify those variables, and they tend to look like this, something like that, and then we have instructions that draw to the screen, including our own instructions that let us draw more complicated things than ellipses or, or, or lines, combinations of ellipses and lines and all the other things that we can learn about, for example, in the, in the processing um, documentation, um, which I hope you've all had a chance uh, to, to look at in, in recent weeks because you can get lots of ideas just from the things that you see there. So where did processing go? So um, with that said, I want to recap the things that we talked about today. We talked about simulation uh, and how simulation is basically a, a subset or special case of generative art where, um, where the rules reflect a, a real world. For example, moving objects, things that don't change completely randomly. And then when we, when we went into implementing a simple simulation of a bouncing ball type thing in processing, we saw that we needed to use variables such as these floats that, and that our variables, uh, that working with variables involves declaring them. For example, here where we make the sure that there's a variable called X and it initially has um, uh, the value 400. It involves um, using or reading them. For example, when we do something like this, we are reading whatever is in the variable X at the time that we draw the ellipse. And finally, it involves modifying them 
um, particularly in a rule-based way. For example, when we do something like say, if x is greater than 400, x equals zero. So that might be something where something hits the right-hand side of the screen and it instantly appears at the left-hand side of the screen. Lots of different rules um, we could think up here. Um, and so this, these three um, aspects of using variables in our processing sketch um, relate back to our general concept of simulation um, in specific ways. Our declarations, our variable declarations are like ways of saying um, what are the things that change in our model. And when we use variables, we're answering the question, how is this part of the model visually or sometimes sonically expressed to us. And when we modifying, when we modify variables, that's, that is our answer to the question are, what are the rules by which things change or move in this world? So variables, and the new syntax of variables that we've introduced today can seem, I think sometimes like an abstract thing, but really it's about answering these three creative imaginative questions. So um, please uh, have some fun um, playing and experimenting with these kind of ideas. You can find further tutorials, of course, online about these kind of ideas. Just, just, just Google for them. And uh, please feel free to ask questions on the Avenue discussion forums. Uh, and I will look forward to talking to you uh, again tomorrow about working with photographic materials, both here in processing um, and also in punctual. See ya.